Um, quick review. You get better at drawing finishes as the day went on. Sort of. Um, that we kind of we, we went into these types of natural selection and types of reproductive isolation and kind of combined them together in the Galapagos example. The idea that uh, founder species hits Galapagos Island one and then gets split off to Galapagos Island two gets different. And our, our, we did some directional selection there with the seeds getting bigger and bird A evolving into bird B on the second island, coming back and not choosing to mate with bird A. So now the behavioral isolation happened after geographic isolation, right? Now they're competitors and the competition, if B is losing badly enough, which we said he was, we said that the B birds end up getting pushed into a more nocturnal uh, habit. And so they basically become population C. And if they were to go back with the bees on island two, then they wouldn't be out at the same time. And that's your temporal isolation. Any questions about those mechanisms and how they happen? Okay, so we are kind of just finishing up our chapter 17 stuff. Uh, one of the things that inject some math into evolution is a, an equation we call the Hardy-Weinberg equation. Um, I'm not going to make you mess with the equation. Uh, I am going to make you learn the conditions that the equation kind of hinges on. Basically, Hardy-Weinberg, two scientists, Hardy and Weinberg, uh, theorized that <clears throat> basically there's five things that disturb a population's gene pool and make it change. And so Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium is their theoretical idea that if you didn't have those five things, stuff wouldn't change. They'd be at equilibrium. And so the Hardy-Weinberg principle says there's five things that upset that equilibrium. And so the equation is based on those things and basically tells you based on which of those five things are the strongest, allows you to kind of predict how the population may change. Here in this level, I mostly just want to get those things. I think they'll be fairly easy to remember. So number one, uh, if in any way that population has mating preferences. Of course, this means it's a sexually reproducing population. If there's any way in which, in which the, the mates are chosen is not random, it's okay. things are going to change. Traits are going to be favored. Leads directly to a very strong uh, selection pressure called sexual selection, different from natural selection. We'll talk about that in a minute. So non-random mating disturbs equilibrium. Uh, population, the smaller it is, the more change is going to happen. I mean, think about it. Think about a population of 10 ele elephants versus a population of 10,000 elephants. One birth or death in your 10 elephant population means a lot more, changes your gene pool of elephants a lot more than one death in your 10,000 elephant population. So the smaller the population, the more of what's called genetic drift is going to happen when births and deaths and immigrations and immigrations happen. Uh, immigration and emigration, there they are. Anything moving in or out of your population changes its gene pool. Be patient. And finally, your friend, natural selection.
So Harding Weinberg basically said those are the five things that cause evolution and set up an equation with those five things as variables in it so that using those variables knowing which of those things are definitely happening and which might not be happening that helps you predict how the change in the population is going to happen all right so we're going to kind of wrap things up with you know we talked about darwin's two big ideas right descent with modification natural selection but natural selection is just one of the things that goes on, the patterns and the, and the forces that shapes population in evolution. We're going to run through a few of the others. Not going to go into as much depth, but things you want to be aware of that cause evolution in populations. Anybody need more time to write here? Okay. So other mechanisms. And this first one is, is, is not necessarily another mechanism, but it's a way that species get linked. If natural selection is happening to one, or if sexual selection is happening to one, or if some other force is happening to one population, there are sometimes other populations that are closely linked to it that will absolutely will evolve in response. We sometimes call co-evolution in certain situations an evolutionary arms race and you'll see why let's go back to bunnies and let's say that the bunnies with their long hair because it got real cold have some pretty ferocious predators in the foxes around them and got pretty cold they've evolved longer hair what's a, an adaptation they might um because they're mostly kind of dark colored it's gotten real cold and they're pretty easy to pick out against the snow for these foxes uh how do you think natural selection might change those bunnies i like the way you said it the lighter bunnies will live and have babies better because why They're not as easy to pick up. Foxes can't see them as well. Well, eventually you might imagine some of those bunnies might be completely white and, and, and be pretty well camouflaged. Well, now the foxes are starving. Which foxes do you think are going to survive? Ooh, yeah. Maybe they switched to sense of smell. Maybe they were working on eyesight more and, and now they, they just, yeah, smell the bunny. I know where it is. Um, so that's one thing that might happen. Something else? those bunnies are just so well camouflaged maybe the foxes evolved to survive with less food anything else might help them get more bunnies maybe they get faster quieter sneak up on them maybe they wave them and move around so they can make an eye good good better hearing instead of smell any of the senses, eyesight, maybe their eyesight gets better, help see those little camouflage bunnies. So you can see how this could be kind of a tit for tat situation, right? The, the bunnies get better camouflage, the foxes get better eyesight or better hearing or whatever. Evolutionary arms race, that's what we mean. So predators and prey are a good example. Another good example, uh, quick question, What? where do we get the most toxic substances on earth? What organisms make the deadliest poisons on earth uh -uh. no not snakes not jellyfish not any of those things that live in australia is that no nope. it is plants plants hands down make the deadliest poisons on earth here's why they can't run away Something wants to eat a plant, mostly that something can just eat that plant. Plant doesn't get to hide, the plant doesn't get to run, fly, or any of that. So one of the defenses, it's not the only one, but one of the defenses a plant might have is the plants that survive 
whatever is trying to munch on it might be the ones that don't taste as good, right? And so gradually you see, you know, sour or bad or like hot tasting plants evolving that defense. Well, stuff is depending on them for food. What's its next evolutionary move? No tongues. <laughs> Maybe less dramatic. It's less sense of taste buds. Yeah, I don't care what it tastes like, right? And then the plant, you know, it's a plant that has something a little more, a little, a little scary, you know, like burns them or, or you know, it's, it's a little acidic or it has something that messes with their nervous system or something. And gradually through this arms race, again and again and again, plant gets a little more toxic, animal evolves tolerance to that toxin, plant gets a little more toxic. You can see that's where we get this runaway toxin effect from this evolutionary arms race. So plant toxins and insect pests are a common example of evolution. And then the really intricate weird one is plants and pollinators, right? Because a lot of times we get because they can't move around. Plants trick animals into doing their sexual reproduction for them. Bees are the most common, but there's lots of others. There's even mammal pollinators, bats, mice. Well, that's an interaction that that plant really can't do without. And so those relationships also get real twisty and weird. Uh, I've got a movie about it that's real old. I almost can't show it. It's, it's narrated by an old British dude that makes everything sound dirty. It's, the movie's actually called Sexual Encounters of the Floral Kind. But like the stuff in it is incredible. Like, like there's, a, there's an orchid in the desert that, that throws up one flower that looks just like a wasp. It looks like a female wasp and it throws up the flower after the males have just emerged from the sand, but before there's any females around. And it basically, and it, it smells like the female and it tricks the male into coming and, and like clasping the flower and trying to fly off with it like it's a female. And it jams its head into the pollen thing. And then it goes and tries to vent with another flower and jams the pollen into the female part of it. Like it's that intricate. That's what coevolution with plants and pollinators can turn into. Like really specific relationships like that. Anyway, uh, maybe at some point. This genetic drift has to do with that small population size, as does the founder of both of those. Just saying that, hey, if, there, if there's not very many, births and deaths have a much bigger effect. If our South American fishes they get blown off course onto the Galapagos Islands, there's like 10 of those finches, that's the founder effect. Suddenly you've got a population that's much more likely to be here, not representative of the overall population. A lot of genetic drifting, low diversity, that's the founder effect. Yeah, they just so so like this had to start with you know one flower that looked enough and smelled enough like a female wasp, just naturally that the male came and tried to do the thing. There's a small population part of Hardy Weinberg genetic drift founder effect. Then the non-random mating happens on the one left here. That is, is real, it's way more powerful than, than most people think. It's called sexual selection. So instead of the environment dictating what traits are good, sexual selection happens when mate preference dictates what traits are good. Doesn't sound like much. Man, it can it can run away with it. Whenever you see something, especially in birds, I don't know why birds are so weird about mating preferences, but boy, they are. Whenever you see something that looks like it's completely maladapted, 
whenever you see something in the bird, it's like, how could that possibly happen? How could being bright red ever help a male cardinal? Wouldn't that make them like the easiest prey on the planet? Well, it's because the females prefer red. Like, how could that peacock have made it with that huge tail it's dragging around? Well, because the peacocks that have the show is pretty in the tails. And that one way to look at it, like how could that possibly have happened is, well, if, if that cardinal survived being bright red, imagine how great it's, all its other genes are. You know, if you can manage to drag that peacock tail around and still not get eaten by predators, probably a pretty good male, right? So it's, it's just one of those things that every once in a while creates these weird runaway traits that seem dramatically unhelpful. But because they affect mate preference, it doesn't matter. 